Hello and welcome to episode 289 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Uh, boy, we got a good one today, huh, Ben? Yeah, we covered a lot of stuff. We started with a um, parallel flaw question in uh, logical reasoning and went over the LSAT's number one flaw. Yep, confusing, sufficient for necessary. We're going to talk about it yet again because it appears on literally every law school admission test. Yep. Hopefully you will uh, master that flaw because you're just going to get buckets of free points that you're not currently getting if you really understand the difference between sufficient and necessary. Highlight of the show for me, Ben, was actual lawyer, Nicole Black, uh, one of my best friends, um, really the only person that I'm still in close contact with from law school. Uh, yeah. She's a gaming buddy of mine. She's a previous guest on the show. She's an immigration lawyer in Los Angeles. She's really kind of a baller. Um I hope people enjoy that uh, interview with Nikki. Yeah, it was great. Super insightful into the work she does. Yeah, she's a killer, um, man. What else did we talk about? Yeah, we talked about someone who said that your brain should hurt when you take the LSAT. We said no. Um, someone who got a 176 <laughs> and uh, is wondering whether they should retake it or if that looks bad. Um we also heard from someone who fell off the study wagon and wants to know mm. what to do. Yep. Excellent. Uh, I, I thought we had lots of good uh, tidbits and um, well, I guess we could just dive right in. Okay. Ben, you want to dive into this uh, logical reasoning question? Yeah, let's do it. Excellent. This is uh, another question from prep test 65. Uh, yeah. Section four, question 24, if you want to follow along. Ben, why okay. don't you uh, read this argument? Okay. It says, paleomycologists, scientists who study ancient forms of fungi are invariably acquainted with the scholarly publications of all other paleomycologists. Okay, that's a strong claim, but it's yeah. saying these particular scientists, um, which I've never heard of before, are invariably acquainted, which means always acquainted so they always know about the scholarly publications of other paleomycologists okay yeah I don't know without the that, invariably okay. i guess it would have been open to interpretation right like it it could have been that they are sort of generally acquainted so mm -hmm. it's possible that some paleontologists might only know about the scholarly work of some other paleomycologists but no, we've got invariably and all. Mm -hmm. So every paleomycologist knows the work of every other paleomycologist. Makes me wonder how many there are. <laughs> exactly. That's what I was thinking too. I was like, oh, there's seven of these people and they all know each other. Okay, great. Yep. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot of reaction to that except for it seems unusual, but okay. Yeah. Um, Professor Mansour is acquainted with the scholarly publications of Pe Professor DeAngelis. Okay. Who is a paleomycologist? Um, I can always already sense what the LSAT's right. going to try to do with this. This yep. person is acquainted with this paleomycologist's scholarly publications. Great. Does that mean that Professor Mansour is a paleomycologist? No, hmm. other people can be familiar with their works as well. We know that every paleomycologist is familiar with the scholarly publications of all the other paleomycologists, but that doesn't mean me or I can't be familiar with their scholarly publications as well. So we don't really know anything about this Mansour guy, but I can just smell the conclusion here. It says, therefore, Professor Mansour must also be a paleomycologist Nope, doesn't have to be true. That's confusing, sufficient for necessary. Yes, it confuses sufficient for necessary is the you know technical name for the flaw. That's the formal yep. name for the LSAT's most common flaw. The reason why Ben was able to see it coming a mile away is because that's been, they've done that, what, a thousand times on the yep. history of the LSAT? Yeah, you legitimately know? so, probably a thousand <clears throat> yeah, times or more. Because we have like 4,500 logical reasoning questions Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's like not a stretch to say that they're, well, maybe they don't do that one fourth of the time, but they do have answer choices that invite you to do that very frequently. So 
it's not surprising at all that they have confused sufficient for necessary. But, you know, even if you don't have that technical name for it, you can object on common sense grounds. How do I know that Professor Mansoor is not Professor DeAngelis's mom? Mm-hmm. How do I know that Professor Mansoor and Professor DeAngelis are not married to each other? Professor Mansoor could be a professor of history. Yep. And have a child or wife who is a paleomycologist, in which case she would probably be familiar with her work. Yep. So it's a, it's a common sense objection. That's one, one thing I like to remind people when we get into the technical terms of sufficient and necessary, I like to remind people that, Hey, this really is common sense. Like, I promise you, you do understand this, even if you don't have a name for it, you understand this in common sense terms. Yeah. Cool. So the question like says, proceed. Yeah. 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 The flawed pattern of reasoning in the argument above is most similar to that in which one of the following arguments. Okay. So this is a parallel flaw question. It's basically asking us for another argument that makes the same mistake as the one we just read. We know that the one we just read said, Hey, all these folks have this certain characteristic. Therefore, some and then it's like this one person has that characteristic therefore this one person must be one of those people um i'm gonna look for an argument that does something similar yeah and it doesn't have to be in that order by the way the conclusion came at the end of the original argument it could come in the middle or the beginning of the correct answer we don't care about that yeah People who struggle with parallel flaw questions, it's actually a super easy thing to fix. It, it's when people tell me that they, oh, I just really struggle on these parallel flaw questions. It's always like, oh, well, I know what your problem is immediately. I know what your problem is. Your problem is you have not identified strongly enough with the flaw in the first place. That's the game. The entire game is you got to know what flaw you're trying to match. Sure. You can't match a flaw if you don't know what the flaw was. So you got to get pissed about this argument. Whether you have a technical name for the flaw is a kind of a secondary concern. You don't have to be an LSAT teacher. We're LSAT teachers. We can give you a name for the flaw. You don't, have, you don't necessarily have to have the name for the flaw, but you do have to have a common sense reaction to that argument and say, hold on a second. There are plenty of other ways that Mansoor might know the work of DeAngelis. What if Mansoor is DeAngelis's boss? What if they are colleagues who are in the same building? They could have totally different scientific disciplines, but they still might know the work of each other because they're colleagues. Um, <clears throat> do you ever predict a, uh, predict a parallel answer before you go into these answer choices? I'll do one of two things. One is what I just did where it's kind of like I'm describing the argument's flaw in a semi abstract way, right? Like uh -huh. I, it wasn't totally abstract. It was, I was talking about a person and people, but still that's a little more general than the original argument. The second thing is I'll just come up with another argument that's like it. Um, yeah. I, I do one or the other. I, I do that I for teaching both. purposes all the time, you know, yeah. just, just to say, so a good answer would be, mm -hmm. now I'm not actually predicting the answer. The, no, the thing have no that, idea what right. the topic is going to be for them. Yeah. This time, Ben, the thing popped into my head was um, all of the Los Angeles Dodgers have played against all of the uh, San Francisco Giants. Okay. Uh, Albert Pujols has played against the San Francisco Giants. All Therefore, <laughs> Albert Pujols must be a Los Angeles Dodger. Yeah. That's flawed because anybody else in Major League Baseball has also played against the Giants before, you know, in my simple example. And sure. yeah, sure. The Dodgers have played against the Giants, but so have the Padres. Um, what I'm doing there is I'm, you know, I'm personalizing it in a way. I'm priming myself to accept the correct answer when I see it, 
because I know what it needs to look like in order for it to be correct. Yeah. All right. Hey, one thing you talked about is you said that uh, the main thing here is to find the flaw. Yeah. Right. If you're struggling with these parallel flaw questions, make sure you understand the flaw and then go find the argument that has the same flaw. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, some people who are a little more familiar are like, wait a sec, what about a parallel reasoning question in which the original argument wasn't flawed? But if, if you, the same thing applies yeah. in the sense that if you look for the flaw and you can't find it and you understand why the conclusion is proven by the evidence, then that means you understand the reasoning behind the argument. Yeah. And then you just go and you look for something yeah. that follows that same valid reasoning. Yeah. Well, and lots of times it's just as simple as, I, okay, we're not reading the question first anyway, right? So we're attacking these arguments. That's our job. Yep. We're going to attack yep. the argument. You attack an argument and you realize, oh shit, they actually uh, proved their conclusion. Yep. These, it's simple. These two premises. And if we combine those, then we're forced to accept the conclusion of this argument. Good job. You know, you guys, mm -hmm. you did it. You made a good argument for once. Yeah. If it's a parallel reasoning question, then you're going to have that same reaction to whatever the correct answer is. And frequently four wrong answers will just be flawed or incomplete. And the correct answer is the only one where they actually proved their conclusion. So you don't have to get into the technicalities of like exactly what, you know, style of reasoning that was, or like, I never even studied formal logic. Right. So I'm not going to be like, oh, well, that's a syllogism. And it's a, you know, like there's a major yeah. premise and a minor premise and a blah, blah. I don't, I don't have any of that on board at all. Mm -hmm. What I have is I can tell you whether an argument is bullshit or not. Right. And when the argument actually proved its conclusion, mm -hmm. then when I go into the answer choices, that's the first thing I'm looking for is just like, hey, we got to find a valid argument here. Yeah. I, I think that that's almost always enough to answer the question, actually. Yeah. Um, I agree. So in fact, when it's not flawed and, and then you read and it says which one has the same pattern of reasoning and they don't use the word flawed. You're like, yep, I know exactly what's going on. I was right in my assessment of the original yeah. argument. And the test becomes totally unsurprising, which is great news. Yeah. Parallel, I, people, people really are afraid of parallel reasoning and parallel flaw, but I don't think they have to be. I, I, I think it's easier than, than you think. I mean, spot the flaw. If there's a flaw, go match the flaw, whether or not they told you there's a flaw. Yeah. If you didn't spot the flaw and they say, which one matches the flawed pattern of reasoning, <laughs> then go you back. need to reread the argument because yeah. you missed it. And they're giving you a chance now to bail yourself out by rereading that argument and spotting the flaw. Yeah. It ain't, it's not that hard. Keep practicing. You will get it. I mean, I know students who like, oh no, I'm going to skip all the parallel reasoning. Even when it's number three, I'm going to skip the parallel <laughs> reasoning. I'm going to skip the parallel flaw. And I'm like, dude, that could be the most formulaic, easiest question on the entire section. Why are you skipping yeah. it? Yeah. All right. I want to tackle cool. these answer choices should be yeah. fairly straightforward because we're looking for, you know, confusing, sufficient for necessary. We have an argument to match and we have my Dodgers and Giants example to match. So it should be pretty clear here when we, when we finally see the correct answer. Yeah. So answer choice A says when a flight on global airlines is delayed, all connecting global airlines flights are also delayed so that the passengers can make their connections. Okay. I like it so far. It's like, it's a universal claim, just like the original sentence in the original argument was a universal claim. Yep. Um, saying this is true for all global airlines flights that are delayed. Since Frida's connecting flight on global was delayed, hmm, her first flight must also have been delayed a delayed global airlines flight okay so i feel like this is making the same mistake um yeah we know that if the original flight is delayed then all the connecting flights are delayed um which is great so does that mean though that if a connecting flight is delayed the original also had to have been delayed no it may have been on time and the connecting flight was delayed just for some other reason some idiots yeah. build their coffee i don't know Sure. Exactly. Perfect. Somebody <laughs> spilled their coffee on her flight. She's supposed to be taking mm -hmm. and a flight attendant or not a flight attendant. Cause they're pretty cool customers. 
uh, a fellow passenger who are not cool <laughs> yeah. customers at all spotted yeah. that and said anthrax <laughs> which makes no sense <laughs> but if they did that right you know yeah. they had a panic attack and passed out in the plane and now tsa is there and the local cops and the fbi and her flight got delayed because somebody spilled their coffee yep we did not have to say you've confused sufficient for necessary we had a common sense objection to a just like mm -hmm. we had a common sense objection to the thing about Mansoor and DeAngelis. It matches that argument. It matches my Dodgers and Giants argument. This is a pretty clear example of how, you know, even on a question number 24, which typically is harder than number four mm -hmm. or number 14, we spotted the flaw in the given argument. Turns out it was a matching flaw question. We read A and it turns out to be perfect. How hard can this question possibly be? Now to double check, we quickly eliminate B, C, D, and E. We pick A and we move on. Yeah, so B says, anytime that one of Global Airlines local ticket agents misses a shift, the other agents on that shift need to work harder than usual. I'm okay with this so far. Like anytime, every time, yep. basically this happens, this other thing happens. We can't dismiss it yet. Yep. Since none of Global's local ticket agents missed a shift last week, the airline's local ticket agents did not have to work harder than usual mm. last week. Okay, so this is flawed. I wish they wouldn't do this. This is, I think, a if I were writing the test, I would never yeah. do what they just did. Yeah, it's it's a it's a little bit of a nuance here, right? They're negating the sufficient condition. It's stupid. LSAC, stop fucking doing this. Don't do this anymore. A and B commit the same logical flaw. They have both confused sufficient for necessary. Yeah. A did what we refer to as a mistaken reversal. B mm -hmm. does what we refer to as a mistaken negation. They're not different in actual logical terms. They are not different. Stop testing a difference that is not an actual difference. Don't do this anymore. So what are you trying to do? Are you yeah. trying to make LSAT <laughs> teachers rich? <laughs> because that's what you're doing. When you test this, which you never would have learned except for in an LSAT class, you're making LSAT teachers rich. This is a dumb thing to test. Stop testing this. So <laughs> since they, they do, let's, let's try to make it as intuitive as possible, right? I guess the first case <laughs> is saying like something happened, like you have the characteristic, therefore you must have had the original characteristic. And this is saying you that characteristic, that original characteristic doesn't exist. Therefore, I understand it. And I get that. I get that LSAT experts will always pick A here and never pick B here. But a statement and the contrapositive of that statement are logically the same. They mean the same thing. They're only different on the surface. The common sense objection to B is there are other ways that these local ticket agents might have to work harder. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody spilled their coffee, Ben. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the common sense objection to B is identical to the common sense objection to A which is maybe somebody spilled their, their coffee, maybe a passenger freaked out, maybe the cops are there now, and then maybe they have to work harder because of somebody spilling their coffee. If I can mm -hmm. make the exact same objection to two different answers, but one of them's right and one of them's wrong, that's a dumb thing for the LSAC to be testing. They shouldn't, they, there's a million other things they could do here. They just don't need to do that. I, I, I don't know why they think this is something that LSAT students need to be familiar with. So I, I really wish they would never do that, but anyway, sorry. Okay. No, no. Um, well, it does turn this into noted. a really hard question, right? It could have been super yeah. easy, sure. but I'm even like top level students are, you know, not, not top, top, not LSAT teacher top, mm -hmm. but people 165 to 170 
are going to narrow this down to A and B and they're going to go, well, they both confuse sufficient for necessary. Like even people yeah. who have the, the technical skills on board are going to be like, well, those confuse sufficient for necessary. They both do. There's two yeah. good answers here. And this is yeah. the one rare instance where I actually kind of agree with you. Like, yeah, they shouldn't do that because this is a technicality to make A the answer, not B. Yeah. Anyway, I bet we can get rid of C, D, and E really easily. Okay. Do we want to talk about any intuitive ways of approaching B? It's a, I don't know that there is an intuitive way. I mean, I agree with you that, mm -hmm. and, and I think that I can illustrate this pretty clearly, Ben, if A wasn't there, we would pick B yeah. in a heartbeat mm -hmm. because it confused sufficient for necessary. That's the flaw they're testing. Sure. Who gives a shit if it's a mistake in negation, the rule if you're in Los Angeles, you have to be in California means the exact same thing as if you're not in California, you can't be in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Each statement implies the other, which means they are logically equivalent. They're different in form, but they're not different in meaning. Why the hell are you testing a difference in form? Because if they're going to test that, then why don't they test? Then why don't they care if the elements of the argument are in a different order? because that's a difference in form without being a difference in meaning, but they clearly don't think that that's a thing that's worth testing. Mm -hmm. So why are they testing that? This is one of my main examples of why they don't understand the test as well as we do. Okay. But they are, but they are consistently going to choose a over B right. Yeah. And top test takers are as just as we did right now. So it's just recognizing that the sufficient condition, the if clause was negated as opposed to the then yeah. clause being affirmed. Yeah, and I, and I don't think we, I mean, you just, that is not a common sense way of, right? <laughs> That's not a practical common sense objection. That's a LSAT teacher mode. Like that's a technical objection. Yeah. So, yeah. If you're, if you're scoring in the, what do you say? High one sixties, low one seventies. That's something you got to get familiar with. Unfortunately. And if you work for the law school admission council, writing the test, stop doing this. It's dumb. There's a million other things you could have put there. It's lazy. Don't, don't test the difference between a mistake in reversal and a mistake in negation. Those are words that only ever appear in an LSAT class. <laughs> There's not a logical difference between the two. Yeah. I guess to, to, <laughs> to hammer more on this point, um, if you were in a court case, no one would give one fuck what direction <laughs> that's going, right? That's no. not a thing. It's, was it necessary or not? Was it sufficient or not? That's no, if a statute issue. said, you know, if you get caught speeding, you must pay a fine. Mm -hmm. And a different statute said, if you don't have to pay a fine, then you didn't get caught speeding. Those two statutes have the exact same effect under the law. Mm -hmm. They use different words, but you're not testing the difference between using different words. You're supposed to be testing a difference in meaning. Mm -hmm. And there's a thousand examples of that on the test. <laughs> they yeah. literally don't care if you put your conclusion first or right in the middle or at the end, which is actually a bigger difference than this. And they don't test that. So they're being inconsistent logically. I don't know if it's a bigger difference. They both seem the same to me, but. <laughs> well, it's a non-difference. Yeah. And they test it in one instance and they don't test it in the other instance. So it's stupid. So stop. All right. All right, C. Anytime the price of fuel decreases, global airlines' expenses decrease and its income is unaffected. Okay, so this is a little bit different from the original in the sense that there are two necessary conditions. I still don't care. Fundamentally, it's if this thing happens and this other thing is going to happen. Yeah, they um, still could confuse sufficient for necessary. So. Yeah, they could. The price of fuel decreased several times last year. Okay. 
So this is actually affirming the sufficient condition. It's like anytime the price of fuel decreases, this thing is going to happen. And then this next sentence says the price of fuel decreased. So instead of confusing sufficient and necessary, it's actually just saying the sufficient condition. Therefore, Global Airlines must have made a profit last year. I mean, that's flawed. We don't know if they're going to make a profit. Um, well, their expenses decrease and their income remains unaffected. I guess that's maybe that is valid, but um, it's not valid because they could have been losing money to begin with. But oh, sure, yeah, it you know it's flawed, but it's just not confusing sufficient for necessary. So not that's confusing. easy to so dismiss. By the end, by the end of the second sentence, you could be done, especially given our confidence in a. Yeah, as soon as they said the price of fuel decreased, then from there they can't confuse sufficient for necessary anymore because all they can do is they can either correctly apply the rule which wouldn't be flawed, which would therefore be an incorrect answer. Or they could just skip to a different topic, which is what they did here, which was profit. But that's not confusing sufficient for necessary. So that one's easy. D, all employees of Global Airlines can participate in its retirement plan after they have been with the company a year or more. Okay. So if you've been there for a year or more, then you can participate. That's an if then statement. That's fine with me. Galvin has been with Global Airlines for three years. Okay. Again, this is like C, it's affirming the sufficient yep. condition. So I'm done. Yep. And it, it, I mean, it goes on to skip to, he has to participate in the retirement plan, but the rule was he can participate. Yeah. D he says he does participate. To. That is a difference for sure between what you're allowed to do and what you in fact do, um, but it's not sufficient for necessary. So again, easy to get rid of. Yep. E, whenever a competitor of Global Airlines reduces its fares, Global must first must follow suit or lose passengers. Okay, that's fine. It's a sufficient condition with a necessary condition. It's an if-then statement. Global carried more passengers last year than it did the year before. Okay. Therefore, um, well, okay. I, I, I'm going to stop here because it, it isn't really even denying. It's not even like it's, it, if anything, it's trying to deny the necessary condition, right? I mean, it doesn't because yeah. the necessary condition has an or statement in it, but it's like, it's, yeah. this is. We don't direction. need to read any further. I mean, they're negating yeah. half of the necessary condition. Even if they go on to negate the other half of the necessary condition, all they That's could do is valid. correctly apply the rule yeah. or skip to some different topic. And so it's, for some other reason, it's not, it's not going to confuse sufficient for necessary. It's as yeah. I predicted here, there's two, this is the one rare question where I actually will agree with you. There are two good answers here. I mean, and, and it's, it's clearly the case. If A wasn't there, we wouldn't even think twice about picking B. They have done this in the past, Ben. There's like, that's the correct answer on other LSAT questions. Mm -hmm. So what are you trying to test? You're, you're actually testing a technical difference with no logical difference. There's no, they are perfectly equivalent <laughs> according to the rules of logic you're testing the difference between a mistaken reversal and a mistaken negation, which are that's things that like only appear in LSAT books. And no, it's so, interesting too, that you say that because that's, those are terms I never used. I always just, and this term I got from my LSAT teacher, which is funny because it kind of itself doesn't totally make sense. It's false contrapositive, which is like weird because a false contrapositive isn't necessarily false. It's just not necessarily true. Right. Mm. Like if you, so it's a weird name, but the point is it was the one name, like you messed up, right? Like you did, you didn't do this. You didn't do the contrapositive correctly. That's all it is. And it's yeah. the same result. Yeah. That's the way I teach it. You fucked up the contrapositive. Yep. Both a and B fucked up the contrapositive. <laughs> they both, they make the identical error of conditional reasoning except for on a very superficial level, they're different. Yeah. I've been yelling about this for years. I, it's always irritated me when they do this. I don't, you know, it, I, I can't, I just can't imagine that they, they actually want to punish somebody who sees both of those and goes, well, they both confuse sufficient for necessary. 
They're both stupid in the same way. <laughs> they literally are. And on other LSAT questions, A wouldn't be there and B would easily be the correct answer because it does fuck up the contrapositive. Yeah. All right. Ooh, you know, it'd be interesting is to have someone describe the flaw made in A in LSAT flaw answer choice language mm -hmm. and have them describe the flaw made in B with LSAT flaw answer choice language. <laughs> I think it has to be the same answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> yeah. What do they call that? A distinction without a difference or a difference without a distinction? It's no, a, a, dink, a distinction without a difference, right? You've okay. made a distinction, but there's no difference. Yeah. It's a superficial, trivial difference. And um, they, they shouldn't do that. That's dumb. All right. <clears throat> That's that. We would love to welcome to the show as soon as she comes on to the Zoom. Ah, there she is. Look at that. Hi. It's actual lawyer, Nicole Black. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Amazing. What's happening? Not much. Good morning. Good morning. Nikki, you were on uh, episode 52, believe it or not, way back in January of 2016. If I recall correctly, I recorded that podcast from a prone position uh, laying on the, my living room floor because my spine had recently exploded yep, and I was I awaiting that. surgery. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm <laughs> fully recovered. <laughs> thankfully. Yeah, look at you standing up and everything. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's a nice skill to have to be able to stand. Um, Nikki is an immigration lawyer, uh, working in Los Angeles. How long have you been an immigration lawyer? Uh, about nine years. Nine years, hard to believe, huh? Time flies. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I met Nikki at UC Hastings. We sat next to each other in uh, some of our 1L classes. We were in the same section. And uh, it's lucky for her, not because she knows me, but because I quickly introduced her to her now husband, Mike, <laughs> uh, my buddy from college. <laughs> so it is amazing how that, how that happens. It's kind of a joke about people going to law school in order to get married, but... Uh, you uh, went to law school, got married, and became an actual lawyer, which is. Uh, and I think in that something. joke, you're going to law school to get married to a lawyer. I married a marketing guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, lucky you to marry a non-lawyer. Uh, uh, I would not want to be married to a lawyer, would you? Oh, sorry, I had like a freeze. What was oh. that? I, I said I would not want to be married to a lawyer, and I asked if you would. Oh. Yeah. Uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, Cause you encounter too many of them already on the day to day. I, yeah. I wouldn't want to be married to myself. So, you know, I think a different, a mix of personalities is helpful. So, um, Nikki is one of my best friends. We play Dungeons and Dragons together. We also play Gloomhaven together. Uh, we geek out regularly with our fantasy gaming. Um, <laughs> and I have learned, I learned very quickly never to argue with her. <laughs> not that <laughs> <Because> bad. <laughs> you're not that bad, but you vehemently defended Mark Zuckerberg's character in the social network, which was the last <laughs> time I believe I ever had any kind of an argument with you. That was alcohol fueled. And we, I, I have since then, I don't know if you've noticed, but since then I have surrendered in all possible arguments. <laughs> with, and that's why we're still friends. It's wise of you. That was <laughs> one of my lawyerly moments of my life, to be honest, because so typical of a lawyer, I don't even care about Mark Zuckerberg exactly. at all. I don't exactly. know why I all of a sudden decided to really care about it. Exactly. Yeah. You got your teeth into that. And you just decided uh -huh. that you were going to take the other side of that debate. And I stupidly kept going and it was kind of <laughs> awkward. <laughs> Our friendship survived it, which is uh, kind did. of a miracle. Um, let's yeah. talk about, can we talk about agree to disagree? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Yeah. You, uh, you know the story. Okay. Well, agree to disagree. Um, Nathan often observes about me that I hate that phrase. I can't agree to disagree uh, about Mark Zuckerberg or anything else. You know, I think I think it's it's you should, yeah, disagree to disagree and and you know talk about it, discuss, argue, 
agree to disagree is just like i give up yeah which you know to be honest if i had to hire a lawyer god forbid if i had to hire a lawyer for any purpose <laughs> i want the lawyer who's not going to agree to disagree i want the lawyer who's going to disagree always right yeah, i want that bulldog in my corner and honestly i mean i feel like now i'm sounding like a, a big arguer i'm not even a litigator but i think it's good you know for lawyers not to to throw their hands up and and move on and to keep arguing their points but also you know friends relationships it's good to disagree isn't that agreeing to disagree though yeah exactly <laughs> i guess maybe the, yeah. the phrase should be agree to disagree forever and never stop disagreeing yeah well with me and mike it's agree to let nikki win all discussions that's <laughs> that's our agreement and it's working out pretty well for us so far you guys are still married so you know he i'm sure he's employed that <laughs> strategy yeah yeah um when we we could talk about real stuff when when uh when we talked on episode 52 i remember that you were uh delighted to be a lawyer is that still the case it is i'm delighted to be a lawyer so what's your yeah. uh, day like what do you like about it well um i'm an immigration lawyer as nathan said so uh it's a transactional field for the most part, you know, every now and again, I do have to go in and argue a case in front of a government officer or God forbid, have to take it to an appeals board or to court. Um, but for the most part, it's transactional. So um, I'm meeting with clients about some goal they have, which is usually some type of, you know, either a temporary visa or a green card or citizenship. I represent a lot of companies. So they're coming to me asking to bring people into the US for work. Um, so I'm looking at their circumstances, um, in the employment based context, it's a bunch of, you know, looking at their credentials, education, the job that they do, putting it together with the types of immigration options that are available, and then coming up with a strategy to help them achieve their goal. Um, so a lot of my filings are done on paper. I argue my cases in writing, there's government forms involved, um, a lot of procedure that you have to know, uh, sending the, the files to the right place and packaging them correctly and um, obviously arguing the, the law of it. Uh, and then, um, so that's you know all kind of done. Um, I have associates that work for my firm, so I supervise them and review the cases that they put together. Um, and uh, every now and again, we'll have people going to consulates all over the world. So uh, helping prepare them to be interviewed by officers when I'm not there which is kind of an interesting exercise. It's a little bit like preparing a client for a deposition, you know, helping them understand what they're gonna be asked, what they should say, what they should not volunteer, uh, learning <laughs> how to keep their answers nice and short, which is my favorite tip for everyone in every interaction with the government. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much my day. Um, I work from home, I always have, even before COVID. So I'm usually sitting right here. How many so, times have you put on a suit in the last uh, year? <laughs> Zero. How about the last five years? 20. <laughs> Four times a year? <laughs> yeah. Pretty good. Yep. Ben, you were going to ask the question. It's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. Well, so Nikki, as you were, you know, you were talking about the things that you enjoy about your job. And when you started talking about forms and knowing the policies and regulations, that sounded to me, like a lot like filling out my taxes or something, which is an extraordinarily <laughs> painful experience. So um, I guess it's just like some people have this enjoyment or fulfillment, right? Through like navigating this morass of like government complexity. 100%. And others don't, right? So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. If you're a person in law school who's loving constitutional law, sitting in class and debating with your, you know, um, uh, classmate across the room, immigration law might not be for you. It's really for people who, you know, love complexity, like the puzzle of it, but then also get a lot of enjoyment in like catching a typo on a form. Yeah. I think, you know, that's me. I don't know why, but it is. <laughs> yeah, <why? laughs> yeah. I mean, I always describe it as 
very tedious in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. and also very high stakes. So you're doing at the same time, you know, it's like, this is somebody's life. Like they're either going to get a green card or not. Yep. And your job is to do though. It's not like super exciting oratory in the courtroom or whatever. Instead it's, uh, you know, you're like taking care of paperwork, dotting I's and crossing T's and you, you got to be like super, super detail oriented. And if you fuck up, it ruins their whole life. 100% correct. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you get a passport number wrong on a form, their life blows up. I right. mean, sometimes you can't fix that mistake. Sometimes someone has to leave the U.S. They have to take their kids out of school. They have to sell their house and they have to leave. <laughs> oh, has that ever happened to you, Nikki? Can you even say yeah. that? Nikki doesn't lose. <laughs> I can. I lose very rarely, but it has happened once. And I can tell you, you never, ever forget. I can, I yeah. won't, but I could tell you the guy's name. I could tell you his kids' names. I know his address. I remember his birthday. I mean, it stays with you. Wow. Yeah. Didn't it take you like years before you ever even lost a full uh, a case? That's how I remember it. Yeah, it's true. I've probably, in terms of loss, I mean, you know, these are no cases foolproof. You can't guarantee an outcome. Um, Usually what we do when we're making these filings, they're going to a government officer, right? Someone with usually like a bachelor's degree, um, various levels of training. They're not lawyers that are adjudicating these cases and they're not judges either. So, you know, sometimes you get a bad officer, Sometimes you get a really tough officer. Long story short, no case is 100% winnable. Um, but yeah, I've had a really good track record, probably in large part because I, I get so much gratification out of the minutia. Um, but yeah, over the last nine years, I've probably lost, like lost, lost and not been able to save two cases. Mm. Do you, you do you have some say in like what cases you take on? Like you have companies that are coming to you, right? And I guess it's nicer to work for some companies than other companies, or they have like people, they're bringing you people that are they're like, yeah, okay, this is likely to succeed or no, not likely to succeed. I don't know. How does that work? Yeah. So um, I'm lucky in my job because when I graduated from law school, I started working for a firm that was just one solo practitioner, one attorney, no legal assistant, no secretary, nothing. Um, Mm -hmm. So when he hired me, I was kind of the second employee. And, you know, over the last nine years, the firm has grown. And now we have a couple of attorneys and some legal assistants. Um, But back then it was just us. And so, you know, I really was able to have a hand in building the firm setting up the infrastructure, figuring out, you know, how we do consultations, when cases come in the door, how we handle them. So all that to say, yeah, I do get some input in the the cases that we take. We have corporate clients that, you know, have engaged us for whatever comes in the door. And so if a company wants to hire a new employee, they come to us and say, how can we do it? And for the most part, we're able to find a way. Every now and then we'll have a, you know, a situation where there's just not an immigration option for someone. And so in those cases, you know, we'll tell them. Um, but, you know, most of those cases, if, if we can find a solution, we take it and we, you know, make it work. We also nice. do family-based work. So, you know, people will call us and say, I'm married to a U.S. citizen or, um, you know, my, uh, I came here illegally 20 years ago. My daughter's about to turn 21. She wants to, you know, sponsor me for some kind of immigration benefit. So we take those cases too. Uh, typically we do in-person meetings with those potential clients where we talk to them about their situation. We tell them, Hey, you have a good case or you have a not so good case, or, you know, you can try it, but here's the risk to you. And then if it's a good match, we start a case. Cool. Yeah, it's a really, it's, it's a nice mix. I mean, I think it's a little bit rare for lawyers to get to work on a variety of cases like that. So you have mm-hmm. the corporate side and, you know, all that that entails. And then you also have just families from, you know, all kinds of circumstances. When you say corporate side, for some reason, the company that immediately comes to mind is Google, but is, 
are we talking like big companies like that? Or are we talking about just a whole mill of sizes? Yeah, there's a range of sizes that we represent for sure. But a company like Google probably files, I don't know, in the thousands of immigration cases a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, like high thousands. So they have their own in-house mm. immigration lawyers mm -hmm. and legal department. And then they also have outside counsel, big, big immigration firms that have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of attorneys that are also working on their cases. So that kind of client is not really for us because we're mm -hmm. a boutique firm, you know, we're much smaller. The way that we handle cases is not kind of high volume, turning things out mm -hmm. really quickly. We're taking on the more difficult cases. We're taking on the smaller companies that want a really like white glove immigration program. White glove? Yeah. So that means bespoke, um, Ben. Bespoke. Yeah, exactly. Bespoke. Right. Ben uh, doesn't know what that yeah. means. <laughs> I looked it up last time. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna find a word you don't know. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, yeah. So so, you know, there's lots of ways to practice immigration law. One common way is on a really high volume basis, you're using templates. So if you represent Google, you've got a software engineer template. That's what you were describes... doing in Canada, right? Yeah, exactly. I used to work for Ernst & Young's uh, immigration law department. Uh, Ernst & Young is a big consulting firm, offices all over the world, hundreds of employees and a big immigration need. So our work there was, you know, templated. We were looking for really efficient ways to turn out a case in a day, lots of legal assistance working on the cases. And so the attorneys are supervising and reviewing their work. But then at my firm, it's uh, more bespoke or white glove. Uh, basically, the lawyers are handling the bulk of the work and preparing the cases. And they're kind of tougher cases. So we're making more nuanced legal arguments things are really tailored to the way a company operates or a much know, more hands-on approach. Much They're white more, gloves. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tailored, white gloves I think are is a good word for it. it. Tailored. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Customized, mm -hmm. expensive, expensive, yes. which brings me to, <laughs> I, I, want, <laughs> I, I want to, I want to, I, I'm sorry that I have to be like kind of a dick all the time, but we have it's hundreds okay, of students. Oh, Go ahead. who <laughs> want to do immigration law. And I don't know that I've ever had one of them who, who understands what my friend Nikki does in immigration law. All of our students, you know, they want to help. And I, 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 I understand what they want to do. They want to help like asylees and refugees and, people who are, you know, washing dishes and doing agricultural labor. And as I understand it, that is just not what you do. Do you know, do you even know anybody who does that kind of work? I do. I mean, I'm a member of this nationwide organization of immigration lawyers and it's all the different types. So it's the people that are standing, you know, on the border, on the Southern border, letting people just walk, like they hold a sign that says Avogado and people walk up and say, you know, I'm trying to get in, what do I do? This officer said this, I got this piece of paper, I don't understand. So there's lawyers like that and they're amazing. They're so amazing. Yeah. There's people that are helping get the kids out of cages. Uh, you know, there's people who work in asylum court every day. Uh, there's people who go to the immigration detention facilities and help people with their cases. But then, you know, the most of the lawyers that I work closely with and, you know, know really well work in the employment based space, you know, working with companies. So, yeah, I know those lawyers, oh. but it's not what I do. Do you know even how they get paid? <laughs> the people at the borders? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think a lot of them work for nonprofits. Yeah, and uh, have, grants. but it can't be like a, a large salary, right? I mean, this is like, this is a labor of love, probably. Yeah, you do it because you love it, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's people fighting the good fight. And, you know, law schools are going to tell you, well, lawyers, you know, on average, make $100,000 a year. And, and then they'll tell you about their like refugee programs. Right. Those are different the, groups the of disconnect. lawyers. Those are <laughs> that's not the same lawyer. 
Yeah, yeah, they really are. They're they're different groups of lawyers, and people, you know, are doing it for different reasons. I mean, yeah, the folks that that are working for nonprofits and you know helping people that aren't paying them, they're doing it because they're getting fulfillment, not in a paycheck. Unlike me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say you're though, still helping you know, people, Nikki. Don't sell yourself short. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's you what just I was going to say. Are also getting I... compensated <laughs> for that. They're right. just rich. I'm helping them. But... I mean, you know, yes, I appreciate the paycheck, but I will also say I'm kind of surprised that that you know the employment-based immigration isn't more of a thing for law students because a lot of law students want to go into some kind of corporate law. Um, And I think this is one of the best areas of business related law, because there is still a real person on the other end of the work that you're doing. I mean, I represent actually a lot of employees at big companies like successful employees, you know, software engineers and other types of engineers, scientists, that kind of thing. And they, they, um, they, there's their uh, DACA recipients, which is deferred action for childhood arrivals. They're basically kids who came to the US unlawfully like were snuck across the border, for example, by their parents, have lived in the US for their whole lives. Under the Obama administration, they were finally able to get work authorization, but a lot of these kids went to college here, now they can work and they're being hired by huge companies. And you know they're looking for ways to finally have status here. So just because someone is an employee of a company doesn't mean that they're a rich person. You know, They're just people who have made their way here yeah. Excellent. Um, Nikki, I'm sure you have a whole stack of work in front of you, um, <laughs> which I know makes you happier than just about anything else in your life. <laughs> except uh, Gloomhaven. <laughs> except for Gloomhaven. I never stopped talking about the time where you said that you wanted work to be the primary focus of your life while Mike was sitting next to you on the couch. <laughs> I also never stopped talking about when you guys came back from Canada and you stayed with me for a little while while you were um, getting your, I guess what your furniture was still being shipped and partially lost on the way back from Canada. And uh, I just remember getting up in the morning and you sitting on, you're sitting there at my table and then you just being there without moving, except for to go get a cup of noodles at like noon microwave cup of noodles and then you're just there all the way till like six or seven until we started playing our board games or whatever um that to me is a lawyer an actual lawyer yeah it almost almost sounds like virtual reality nikki you're like sucked into this world and oh that's her biggest dream of all dreams is to actually just be it live inside the oasis (laughs) yeah (laughs) And practicing immigration law in the Oasis. So (laughs) there you go. The second there (laughs) is a VR technology, the second there is a VR immigration court, she will be there. uh, I promise you. (laughs) What would be my avatar? I don't know. Statue of Liberty. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. Hey, Nikki. (laughs) All right. I think we could probably leave it there. Ben, anything else for Nikki? Nikki, anything else for our audience? In person. Yeah, it was great to meet you, Ben. I've heard a lot about you. I can't believe we've never met before. Oh, that's right. It was just me doing the interview last time. Oh, well, nice to connect you two. I'm sure you'll uh, meet uh, sometime soon. We'll get together now that everybody's getting vaccinated and whatnot. Um, Yeah. Nikki, last time you had a lot of people reaching out to you after the show to ask you questions about uh, immigration law. Was that too annoying or do you want to try that again? No, it was great. Yeah, I always appreciate it. And, you know, I mean, there's self-interest too, because my firm hires lawyers. I like to meet young lawyers because one day I might need them. And assistance, paralegals and all kinds of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. How do people uh, reach out to you if they want to connect? Yeah, so uh, you can email me. My email address is black, my last name, B-L-A-C-K, at daysodlaw.com. Um, D-A-Y-Z-A-D law.com. Law. That's right. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And I'm also on Twitter, uh, Nikki Marie Black, N-I-K-K-I 
Marie Black. Excellent. Thanks for coming on. Uh, hopefully it won't be 230 more episodes before we have you back. Everybody always loves to hear from you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. That's nice. Cool. All right. All right, thanks, guys. Nick. Have a good one. Yep. Yep. See yeah. you soon. See ya. Excellent. <clears throat> Any wrap up comments about actual lawyer, Nicole Black? Oh, she's super sweet. That was super informative. That's awesome. And yeah. apparently I still don't understand disagree to disagree, but Hey, <laughs> she just loves the struggle, man. It's like, and she, to me, it, it, shit, God forbid, you know, if I got arrested for something and I needed somebody to defend me, I don't want somebody who's going to be like, nice. I don't want somebody who's going to be getting along. I want somebody who's going to be telling me what the weaknesses are with my case. And I want somebody who's going to fight it out. Uh, on the paperwork and in court, I want somebody who's just going to be not afraid to butt heads. You yeah. know, you're hiring a champion, right? You're hiring a gladiator. It ain't about compromise and negotiation and, and all that. It's, <laughs> there, this is zero sum. I mean, I'm either going to prison or I'm not. And I want the person who's going to like fight to the death. I don't want somebody who's going to be, you know, <laughs> I don't know. And, and it doesn't have to be criminal context in any context. You know, I want my green card. I don't want to be told no. I want to win. And uh, she's just the type of person who is, she, she's going to stake out her claim and she's going to fight for that. And I think that that's the type of person, I think that's the type of personality that tends to excel in law. Well, I think we can just agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> There it is. All right. Uh, um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Ready to move on? Yeah. Pearls versus turds. Pearls versus turds is the segment of the show where we uh, we attack. Uh, well, we 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 take a bit of received wisdom from the internet, and we decide whether it's actually good advice or not. Um, you want to read it? Sure. A Reddit post that may qualify <laughs> a fragment here. So apparently this is from Reddit. While you guys have slightly talked about something similar with a pearl versus turd in the, in a past podcast, it was about balance, eating healthier and running the points that struck out to me, stuck out to me, sorry, was when it mentioned Making your brain stronger and faster means intensive, stressful work and can't go with 100% intensity at all times. You'll strike out, stroke out. All at, at the same time, you can't be 100% relaxed during LSAT study. Best, Sarah. I, I'm sorry, I'm not totally following this post. Can do you, do you follow it? Well, I mean... Uh... I'll read this excerpt from the actual post. It says, okay. if your head hasn't exploded by the time you're done with the section, that only means you could have wor worked harder. Stole that idea from sprinters. If your heart didn't explode at the end of the race, that only means you could have run faster. Making your brain stronger and faster means intensive, stressful work. Misery and pain are part of the process. So look to embrace it. We have a link to this whole post. Um, it's an analogy, Ben, which we use all the time in our classes. Analogies can be wonderful teaching tools. Yeah. Analogies are also one of the main logical fallacies because you analogize to something that doesn't really fit. Yep. And here sprinting is an exactly wrong thing to be trying to analogize to. Ben, did you ever, did, okay, your personal experience, did you ever feel like your head was going to explode when you finished a section of the LSAT? Oh, between me and you, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, the, no. If anything, right, um, I, look, there, there, I do remember this particular time when I was dealing with a formal logic question in logical reasoning. This was studying, not during a test, or maybe I took it during a practice test and then reviewed it afterward. And I knew the correct answer. And 
I was, I kept reading the passage and for the life of me, I could not figure out why the correct answer was correct. Why it was a must be true question. Why does that have to be true? And I was drawing and drawing and drawing. And then I don't know, at some point it clicked and it took me like 20 minutes. I remember putting my head on the table. So there was something that was like, you know, sure. not like the wires weren't connecting. Uh -huh. So yeah, in that experience, I could feel my brain like being overworked, but that's not like the kind of thing I'm using as a litmus test for whether I did well on the section or could have worked harder. That doesn't make yeah. sense to me. Well, and the fact that, you know, it did hurt once doesn't mean that it has to hurt in order for you to make progress. This poster is basically saying the, I mean, they're relying on be sore. Well, there's that study that there is a study that says that, that uh, the LSAT makes physical changes to your brain. That's true. Yep. Then this guy goes, well, when you make physical changes to your body, it involves pain. Therefore, making physical changes to your brain, which the LSAT entails, has to be painful. You know what's interesting? Just last week, I was reading a book about exercise, and it cited of studies you were. About, <laughs> about soreness. Because one of the questions that this person gets a lot apparently is like, do I need to be sore? If I'm not sore, does that mean I'm not working out? And he made the waters so murky that you basically cannot conclude anything from soreness. One, some people feel sore even when their muscles show no sign of wear or tear. Okay. So we have the uh, effect without the cause. Exactly. Potentially. Mm -hmm. Some people don't feel sore even though their muscles were injured. So we have the so cause without the effect. Yeah. And, and then you got to keep in mind, there's muscles that are injured and therefore feel sore or don't feel sore. And then there are muscles that have been worked, yeah. which is actually going to be what more likely leads to growth. But you have cases <laughs> yeah. where people feel sore you, and don't feel sore. So yeah, it's like injuries are sore and you don't want that. So you don't want that. Yeah. Right. So it, the point was, it's like, I got done listening to that and it was, a, it was a study apparently that was done in Japan. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Soreness basically tells you shit. Well, and also, so, yeah. I mean, and, and on an entirely different subject yeah we're not talking about biceps we're talking about your brain exactly does your brain even have nerve endings in it i don't think it does I, i'm pretty sure that you your brain i don't think <laughs> i'm not sure you can actually feel pain from anything happening inside of your br actual brain from the source <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i guess people get headaches you know? so there must be some sort of yeah but, but i don't know that that's your brain I, way, that the, could be your the, eyes or your, you know, any other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom line here is for this argument to make any sense, the analogy has to work. And the thing you're analogizing to your muscles have to work and they don't even work. Right. Yeah. And the LSAT is clearly not a sprint. We say this a, a thousand times. You yeah. shouldn't be sprinting. You should be calmly, carefully, accurately answering one question at a time. You should not be sprinting. Your brain, I'm sorry, but your brain should not hurt. People who are good at the LSAT experience no pain whatsoever because it's just fun, easy puzzles that they get to solve. Now, they have to be careful with them, but it shouldn't hurt. If it hurts, I think you're reading too quickly. I just think you're like forcing yourself to try to do more than you can actually do. So... I've got this one firmly in the turd pile, Ben. I don't know what you think. I agree. I will say though, because I feel like it's like encouraging people to seek for the, like almost like try to be sore, right? Um, I could see someone who studies for an hour and they tackle the challenging things, right? They're like, oh, I suck at games and they don't avoid it, unpack it. And by the end of that hour, they're like, okay, I need a break. Like that was mentally exhausting for me but this idea that it's going to be painful is strange but i'm not surprised if they feel like hey i need to go do something that's a little less mentally taxing i think that's fine that probably shows that you are tackling the stuff that's most challenging for you this guy wants your head to explode no that's not what we're looking for it's a turd Thank you, Sarah, for sending that in the scoreboard. Now, by the way, uh, we've been doing this for a few years. We've found 13 pearls against 43 turds. 
and 22 ties, which just means that we were too chicken to put it in the turd pile. But I mean, <laughs> the none of the ties are things that we're going to repeat ever in an LSAT class. So uh, we're looking at a pretty solid, um, yeah, I guess that's 13 pearls against a total of 65 turds and ties. So there's a lot of bad advice out there, I guess, is the uh, point of the segment. Yeah. If you have a pearls versus turds candidates, you can email help at thinkinglsat.com or you can talk to us on social at thinking LSAT and uh, suggest items for the agenda, including um, pearls versus turds candidates. You can also just email us random shit. Uh, you want to dig into the mailbag, Ben? We got all kinds of I different do. messages. All right. I let's do, but before we go on, oh. I want to say something. So this is, you brought up the uh, pearls versus turds, which today came from Reddit, right? Thank you, Sarah. Yes. Uh, I did have a reaction as I was reading that. I'm like, why? Why, Sarah, are you looking for information on Reddit? I just can't yeah. imagine that's a good source by any means. Um, it's just, it's almost like worse than the internet. <laughs> I know it is the internet, but. I mean, it seems like a cesspool. Our, our guy, Graham, you know, our buddy Graham, who's, you know, previous guest on the show, I think he does a pretty good job of monitoring, uh, moderating that channel. Mm. But it's still one of these like, well, all sides are equal you know, like it's not curated. It's just like, well, you can say what you say and you can say what you say. And then like, hopefully the best advice filters to the top, but it doesn't. That's the thing. It's like nifty, you know, clever analogies, like the one that we talked about today. That's a, that's a, um, you know, it's like a striking example, this analogy to sprinters, but it's completely wrong. It's totally misleading. It just doesn't help. And there's way worse shit than that on Reddit, as everybody who's ever been on Reddit understands. So a little tangent here about Reddit. My second son, for some reason, has a weird knack for making posts that get it that get extraordinary amount of likes. So he commented on some YouTube video and got 41,000 likes for a comment on youtube for a wow. comment and then he edited it because all these people were looking at it. he said this has been edited i removed the original content and he got like another twenty thousand because everybody was like oh you'd remove the content he's like ah ha ha now you don't know what it was said and he posted so yeah and then he posted something on reddit and it got uh well i don't know how many likes it got on or upvotes it got on reddit but it got picked up by some TikToker who then had it viewed 52,000 times. It was a meme he created. And I'm like, dude, what do you, what? I don't understand. Like, I'm trying to promote stuff. I can't get anywhere close to that. He's like, I don't know. I just say these random things and they are mildly funny. But my point is, is that what gets upvoted on Reddit and downvoted, there's a certain amount of randomness to it. And it's just what people like, right? It, like it feels good in the moment or there's something yeah. funny about it. So if you're going on to Reddit looking for like good LSAT advice, you're depending on the whims of the masses, I think. Yeah, tread carefully. I mean, and if you find something that you're not sure whether it's good or bad advice, uh, one, it's probably bad. <laughs> Two, email yeah. help at thinkinglsat.com or hit us up on social at thinkinglsat and you know we can discuss it on the show. But it's just we see a lot more bad advice out there than we see good advice. So be be careful. Yeah. Also, let's hire your son. I have thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, want to dive into the mailbag? Sure. All right. I think we should try to do these kind of rapid fire so we can you know give everybody some attention. But go ahead. Sure. Hi, Ben and Nathan. First of all, thank you for making a great podcast with no nonsense advice. I recently took the February LSAT and got a 176. Nice work, which is really exciting. I actually already signed up for April as I knew that I messed up two questions at the end of my logic game section on February, and I felt that it wasn't showing my true potential. Since I paid for it anyways, I'm going to retake and do believe I can improve those few points. However, I saw a lot of comments on Reddit about not retaking a mid-high 170s score as if you happen to score, in case you happen to score below this score. It shows poor judgment to admissions committees that you signed up for a retake. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, poor judgment, according to 
random Redditors. <laughs> yeah, what, have they talked to admissions committees? <laughs> Are they admissions people? Have they yeah. ever talked to, do they, I mean, even if they have heard that from an admissions person, do they know that it's actually real advice? Like really think about it for a half second. You have a 176, you go take it again, you get a 174. When the law schools submit your numbers to the ABA and what? Then they well, I think they submit the numbers to the ABA. I'm not sure if they submit them directly to US News, but it's I don't public. Think they do. It's public data. Right. So they the US News can pick up that that data from Reddit, but or sorry, from the pick up data from from ABA. the ABA, from the 509 yep. website. They're only gonna get your 176. So yeah. why would the law school care about a number that is never gonna be exposed? Yeah, you took it say, again. Oh, why'd you take it again? Because you, you thought you could, you do, could better? do better. <laughs> and you happen to score her. a couple points worse, but you're still in the one set solidly in the 170s. I mean, it's not like he's going to take it again and get a 150. Yeah. And even if he did, that's so extreme. You'd just be like, yeah, I was about to puke. I was right. I don't know what happened. COVID hit me right then. It, it seems clear that law schools only care about your highest score. And I think this whole poor judgment thing is just purely made up. Yeah. Now that said, I don't think there's any upside really either. I, I don't think there's any actual difference between a 176 and a 178 is what I'm saying. Sure. Because they're already in the 75th percentile. You're already in the 75th percentile of every law school. I mean, Maybe not this cycle because we have twice Maybe as many not. people applying with actually, 175s and higher. I actually think so, for this cycle and possibly next for anyone who gets kicked over to the next cycle. It's possible that Yale is going to put out their 509 this year and their 75th percentile is going to be 177. That is theoretically possible. But even if it even if that does happen at Harvard, Stanford, Yale they still are admitting 75% of their class with something lower than that. You know, you're still going to be above their 50th percentile and, and above their 25th percentile, obviously. 176 is solidly within the comfort zone at every law school. You're, you're still literally going to be above the 75th percentile at every other school in the top 14 with that 176, you know, even if Yale happens to come in at a 177 this year or whatever it is. So I don't see a lot of reason to retake. I think given the uptick in numbers recently, I'd say go for it. I don't see a downside and I see a small potential upside. Okay. Yeah. So I think we can probably agree to agree that it doesn't <laughs> really matter. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. really matter. Right. It's like, well, fine. Take it again. Maybe you get a click or two higher. I mean, literally only has four more points that he could possibly even improve. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> there's no downside because if you score a click or two lower, they don't care. They're only going to care about your highest score. So it doesn't matter. There's not much upside, maybe a tiny bit. There's not much downside, probably zero. If you want to take it again, fine. I think this whole poor judgment thing is complete bullshit. Yep. Next one. Hi. Oh, that was H. Thank you, H. Next one. Hi, Nathan. Oh, this was Nelson. He's such a nice guy. Uh, he's an Australian in our current uh, Demon Live classes. Um, cool. Hi, Nathan. Been adopting your advice of employing short seven-day plans to keep a good routine. I don't think I ever said anything about a seven-day plan, but maybe I did. Um, he's been reading my weekly newsletters that are coming out okay. um, following that advice. Uh, he says, unfortunately, this week, I didn't have my best week and I could have been more disciplined. Obviously, the usual things like guilt start to cloud my head at times. What are your best tips to get over a week that perhaps might not have gone to plan? At the moment, I just try and shake it off, but it always creeps back every now and again. Kind regards, Nelson. And he gave me permission to discuss this on the podcast. He wanted to know what you had to say about it. Yeah. So the thing that comes to mind right away is this uh, short lecture by Sam Harris called Begin Again. Mm. Um, one thing he talks to uh, his followers who are trying to learn how to meditate is that 
often throughout meditation, you will get distracted. You will start thinking about other random things. And then you'll have to come back to focusing on the meditation, right? And you have to begin again. And when people realize when they quote, wake up and realize that they've been lost in a train of thought, they often get frustrated, which he points out is itself a train of thought that is pulling you away from your ultimate goal. And he said, just accept the fact that you are going to constantly be beginning again. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And as soon as you do, you just, the sooner you can accept that, the sooner you can get back into meditation. Now, I know this is an analogy, but I think it's directly related to not only the LSAT, but to just life in general. Nothing ever goes as ideally as you'd like it to go. If that were the case, you'd be a fucking God. So everything is messed up, right? You like, you have some plan and it just doesn't quite go the way you expect it to. And sometimes it's just your lack of discipline. Sometimes you get distracted by things that may not even, you know, be your fault. It doesn't matter. At any moment you can begin again. And if you begin again, 10 times, a hundred times more than anyone else, then the summation of all your success will way outpace what it would have been if you got caught in the like cycle of like assessing what you should do about that now. So it's that just one day at a time. <laughs> no, but I mean, that, that totally makes sense. It's one day at a time and it's, you know, stop with the guilt. It doesn't, that's not progress. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think for Nelson specifically, if it's related to the LSAT, I, boy, I end up on this advice so often. Do one LSAT question. Right now. <laughs> How do I get restarted? I've had a bad week. How do I get restarted? Well, open up the demon, click drill, do one question. It's the same advice when you're taking a section. Oh, that game didn't go well. Okay. Start Who the next cares? Game. Do the next one. <laughs> yeah. Right now. Yeah. And it's the same for fitness, a fitness practice, meditation practice, trying to quit drinking, uh, trying to be nicer to your family. You know, you're going to fuck up. You're, you're gonna, you're gonna let your room get messy, even though you've been really trying to be more tidy around the house. Okay. Well make your bed, you know, (laughs) like, yeah throw something in the trash. It's a a baby step in the direction of where you want to go. People love to just like plan and have this whole grand that's, you know, this is one of the reasons why I I do hate like a three month study plan. Study plan. Exactly. What? You're not going to follow that. You're not going to follow that for three weeks. You're probably not going to follow that for three days. Yeah. I, I care what you do in the next three minutes. Yeah which starts with the next three seconds, (laughs) do a fucking question. You (laughs) won, try to get it right. If you struggle, read the explanation, watch the videos, get better, ask your teacher a question. You know, it's, it's all, it's always all about like the, the, this moment, which, you know, Sam Harris is all about the meditation stuff, which is really just kind of training you to, to be in this present moment. Yeah. Like you can decide now to start living however you want to live, however you want to be. You're going to probably fall off of that in 20 minutes, <laughs> but yeah. then make that decision again. And eventually you'll look back and you're like, I mean, I've fallen off the, you said exercise. I've fallen off the exercise wagon a thousand times. Right. That's see, that's the thing about you, right? I would describe you as what my like most workout committed friend, probably like, I don't know anybody who works out more than Ben Olson, Mm -hmm. but you just said you've fucked it up a thousand times. Yeah. But the thing you've done is you've 999 times or sorry, a thousand and one times you've Mm -hmm. restarted that process. Right. So it's always about just like that next day. I mean, even in your own like individual workout, right. You plan on doing a certain thing. You get tired, you get lazy, you get distracted. You don't really finish exactly what you wanted to do today. That's going to happen. But the thing that you're going to do is you're going to get back on the horse tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's really the difference in the long run is just that beginning again idea. Okay. Love it. That's awesome. You want to take the uh, next one? Sure. Hello, thinking LSAT team. 
I recently listened to episode 132, where someone wrote in asking Nathan to phrase his hatred for Halo Top in the form of a conditional statement. Wow, I forgot about those days. Um, Nathan said something like, I don't know whether or not Halo Top actually is ice cream, but it's not ice cream in my opinion. Which, by the way, is not a conditional statement at all. No. This, is not a, <laughs> this is not about conditional reasoning. This is about Halo Top and how much it sucks. Uh, so you just ignored the request for the conditional statement and doubled down on your hatred for the yes. ice cream or whatever it is. I had to write in to tell you guys that according to food science, Halo Top does not qualify as ice cream. Yep. Okay. I got my bachelor's in food and nutrition science from Florida State University. In one of my classes, we learned that in order to be labeled ice cream, the product has to contain at least 10% milk fat. Okay. Halo Top is made from skim milk, 0% fat, so it does not qualify as ice cream and cannot be labeled as such. I hope you enjoy this tidbit, and perhaps it will help Nathan sleep better at night knowing his, that Halo Top is definitely not ice cream. I actually love Halo Top, but I love the podcast more. Thanks for all that you guys do. Best, Danny. Wow, Danny likes Halo Top. <laughs> yeah, aside from her poor taste, I really appreciate yeah. <laughs> her nice email to the show. I'm glad she's a fan. Halo Top is garbage. Um, I dis I seriously disrespect anybody's food choices if you consume Halo Top. What the hell is that? I mean, the fact that it doesn't have fat these days, like what we know about nutrition, is actually that fat is sort of good. And so this is so not this as like, bad as sugar, right? So, right. And so what is Halo Top? I mean, it's actually like empty calories, right? So yes, it does have fewer calories than ice cream. Yes. You can eat the whole damn pint of it and it's going to be less, uh, calories of course, but it's also just totally unsatisfying and yeah, it what are you tastes putting like in your body? frozen sand. So it's just, no, it's, that's awful. Uh, and I'm glad we got reminded, um, 150 episodes later of how much halo top is trash um hey send us your favorite moments uh from the show by the way like danny did you can help us grow on social media by sending timestamps from a funny or helpful tip from the latest episode or you can ask us any question anytime and uh, make your way into our mailbag email help at thinking or find us on social at thinking lsat um, ben, I think I need to wrap it up there. You got any uh, yeah. final things to say before we close the show? No. Oh, let's do this. Excuse of the week. Yep. Um, a student in class said, I always narrow it down to two and pick the wrong one. What do you think about oh that gosh. excuse? Okay. For first of all, that's like the most common excuse. Or no, yep. maybe it's, I need to go faster and... <laughs> I always get it down to two. Yep. Yeah, that's every one who's ever picked up an LSAT. So um, the test really isn't testing your ability to get it down to the last two. It's testing your ability to decide between those last two. That's what everybody's trying to figure out. Okay. And then what so, do you say to somebody who says that they always narrow it down to two and they just always choose the wrong one out of those two. Oh yeah. For, first of all, that's not actually the case. What's happening is you're narrowing it down to two. And on some occasions you're choosing the right answer, which is great news. Um, but you're not being kicked in the face, right? When that happens. So you don't notice that you pick the right answer in that situation. But when you narrow it down to two, which is every time, and then you get the wrong answer, then you get kicked in the face. You're like, oh, I got it wrong. And I had narrowed it down to two. So I must always be picking the wrong answer when I narrow it down to two. No, you have a seriously skewed perspective on what's happening there. Just keep in mind, this is what's happening to everybody. And everybody has to do the same thing. They have to review the question, understand why the wrong answer that they chose is wrong. And under also understand why they didn't choose the correct answer, which is correct. They made at least two mistakes. Um, and that's how you learn the test. So yeah. it's not an excuse. So selection ah. bias means that you're not even right. You're not always narrowing it down to two and picking the wrong one. You're just reviewing yeah. your mistakes, in which case a lot of the time you're going to have narrowed it down to two and picked the wrong one, but you're not even looking at the ones where you narrowed it down to two and got it right. That's just the selection yeah. bias thing. So this is actually just false to begin with. Yeah. The other thing that I would like to say is if you frequently are narrowing it down to two, 
I think you're probably being too passive in your approach to those answer choices anyway. Ben does not think that there are two good answers for mm -hmm. hardly any questions. I mean, we actually did yeah. one on today's show where there literally were two good answers, yeah. but that is the super rare exception. Most questions have four garbage answers and one clearly correct answer. Yeah. And uh, for when people tell me that they narrow it down to two and pick the wrong one, I'm like, why are you being driven by the answer choices? You know, it, it's far more often that I eliminate all five yeah. than that I narrow it down to two. It's not, yeah. I am not looking to narrow it down to the two best answers and then pick one. There aren't mm -hmm. two best answers. There's one good answer and four shitty ones. And if I eliminate all five, which I frequently do on the first read through, I mean, I'm reading through those answer choices pretty quickly and I'm like, nope, 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 nope. Oh, and nope. That happens from time to time. Yeah. It happens pretty frequently, actually. And I get done with all five and I go, well, I didn't like any of these, but guess what? I was right on four of those on, you know, on one of them. Yeah. I need to kind of lower my standards a little bit or reread it to really understand what it said, but I'm not getting down to two or God forbid three contenders mm -hmm. and then choosing from among them. If you're doing it that way, you're not making good enough predictions. You probably didn't tackle the passage or the game properly in the first place. You didn't make a good prediction. You didn't really know what you were looking for. And now you're in this business of comparing answer choices to each other, which is just the kiss of death. Yeah. <clears throat> That's the excuse of the week. You can email help at thinkinglset.com again, or find us on social at thinkinglset. If you would like to uh, suggest an excuse of the week, maybe you uh, heard somebody say it in class or your study partner said it, or uh, if you're super introspective, you might've caught yourself making that excuse and you would like to uh, pillory yourself on yeah. the podcast, <laughs> send us uh, an email help at thinking .com. Okay. Uh, by the way, generally be LSAT famous, uh, get on an upcoming show, email us help at thinking .com. If you have questions about the LSAT demon, you can email help at lsatdemon.com. That was episode 289 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Thanks actual lawyer, Nicole Black, for coming on the show. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. <laughs>